people admire power. So if through non-democratic means you have power visibly, then that itself is going to attract many people to you. The choice of who is going to lead Congress and therefore in the impending independence is going to be chosen as the head of government. Um, so that choice was made by the Congress Working Committee in favor of Sardar Patel. There is a way to win a vote even, even when you lose it. You make sure that the winning candidate withdraws. And so that's what Gandhi did. He prevailed upon his yes man, uh, Sardar Patel, to withdraw his candidature. He won the elections after he had been made prime minister. You see, all the people who went to vote, they voted for the man in power, for the leader. And, you know, if Sardar Patel had been there, he would also have won. Namaste all the Sangam Talks viewers. Today we are here with Dr. Conrad Els to discuss the topic which will be very interesting for all our viewers. Namaste sir, welcome to the Sangam Talks today. Our topic for today's discussion is critique of electoral democracy and it is even more relevant for us all as Indians as India is also known as the biggest democracy of the world. Dr. Elst has been a regular speaker on Sangam Talks and needs no introduction but for the sake of all the new viewers, I would take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Elst. Dr. Konrad Elst is a Belgian Indologist with a Masters in Indology, Sinology and Philosophy followed by original field work in BHU and doctorate on Hindu nationalism. One of the few Westerners to actively defend Hinduism, he is known for his blunt and objective views. Author of 32 books, a foreign desk press editor, foreign policy assistant in the Belgian state and he has been a visiting professor at many Indian universities. My first question for the session is about your recently launched book in Dutch. You have actually written several books in Dutch that have nothing to do with the topics you are known for in India. But a few months ago, you brought out Leve Het Walk, which will be translated as Long Live the People. It is about democracy in general and direct democracy in particular. What is its message, sir? So the title is Leve Het Volk, which means Long Live the People. And the subtitle is uh, Polemical Writings on popular sovereignty. The um, title is actually taken from a famous speech by Mao Zedong, the great helmsman. It is namely the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, 1966. So he started talking to the people, long live the people, though the people didn't really answer in kind because they said, long live Chairman Mao which is not the same thing. Um, now, this is a bit of a joke, of course. I'm not going to hold up Chairman Mao as a, as a model of democracy. Not quite. But at least he, uh, he invoked democracy. He liked to play Democrat, not to be it. And so that's, that's a kind of lip service to democracy. You know, as they say, hypocrisy is the lip service paid by vice to virtue. So here, dictators pay lip service to democracy by calling their system democracy. And um, so that's what Mao did. Uh, that kind of dictatorship has a bit gone out of fashion under the liberalization, under Deng Xiaoping. But the last few years under Xi Jinping, it has come back. There are other elements of communist philosophy which he has also reinstated. Anyway, so this is not at all about the uh, Chinese forms of democracy, attempts at democracy. It's really about the situation in Europe. And... Um, you know, part of these uh, papers are about democracy in general. Some of them are particularly about direct democracy, which people in India probably hardly know. 
it is a system that you have heard about, uh, if at all you have heard about Switzerland. In Switzerland, this is really the system that a few times every year, the voters are called to the voting booth to speak out on a, a few questions. Questions that have been uh, put on the agenda by a number of citizens. So you need a certain amount of signatures and then the specific question is put on the ballot. So that's direct democracy. These have the force of law. So they're not consultative referenda as they are called in some countries where the government is free to take it or leave it. No, these are binding decisions. And um, in Switzerland, that is already a fairly old tradition. In um, some states of Germany and of the United States, it goes also in that direction. Usually not as completely, but essentially you do have direct democracy there. So that's what it's about. Uh, but so the general question of democracy, even in a parliamentary form, in a representative form, is also very much debated. And the two are not at all uh, in contradiction. The, uh, the Swiss system or the German or American system, of course, has referenda coexisting with a parliamentary system. So it is only when the population draws a question to itself and puts this question on the ballot that uh, it, it bypasses the popular representatives. Otherwise, it is simply the representatives that take decisions just like in any other country. But so my argument is that this is a very desirable system and that a number of uh, evils that uh, are happening uh, right now, for instance, in the European Union, would be prevented by this. So, um, sometimes people uh, overreact a bit when they get a chance at referendum, because then they, they bring out everything they had wanted to say in other real referenda that, you know, were never offered. And so a famous example is uh, the, the Brexit referendum. So the, the British people, the Scottish people rather, had voted two years earlier on the independence of Scotland. So some people who were against referendum said, yeah, but you know, the people are always going to vote for the most extreme option now that for once they can have a say. No, you see, they'd cast a very mature vote. And in this case, they did not vote for independence for Scotland. Then with the Brexit, the government had imagined that a similar thing would happen, that uh, the Brexit would be defeated, the, the exit from the European Union by Great Britain. And um, that might have happened. It was very closely contested. It was very close to 50-50. But then what happened is that uh, the German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel uh, opened the floodgates wide for immigrants and the European system is such that if you are allowed into one European country, you're allowed in all the others also. And Germany is a very desirable country where many so-called refugees like to go to because, you know, it's very opulent and a good social security system. But the really preferred country is England. And so this has to do mainly with the fact that you don't need an identification, which in Germany and Belgium and France and so on you do. It has also to do with the language. Most people from Somalia and Afghanistan and so on they have learned some English in school and it's not always the brightest to come over. So learning yet a new language as an adult is a lot of extra effort. So they're happy to just use their school English. Anyway, so Britain is very desired and therefore if the frontiers with Germany are open, many of these people are going to come to Britain 
And so the decisive reason for a majority of the British voters to vote against the European Union was precisely this threat that they had lost control over their borders. And so, so I mean, I, I think it is really Angela Merkel's fault that the Brexit won through. Anyway, now it has happened. And here I have to admire the British government. You see, most of the, of the rulers, like the later Prime Minister Theresa May, for example, had campaigned against the Brexit. Then you see when 53% um, chose the Brexit, then she said, OK, you have chosen the Brexit, we're going to organize it. And so other people, you know, in this typical fashion of the European Union, try to block it. They said, no, no, there should be a, a ne next vote and so on. Keep the people voting until they cast the right vote and then stop, you know. And um, so, so, you see, nothing doing. You see, the British government said, no, you see, you voted for the Brexit. Well, OK, you're going to have it. Um, so that's, that's nice. You know, there are a few countries where this would be the case. But so that's, that's one example of what a referendum can do. That's one of the most radical examples, really. In uh, India, you don't have that system. But sometimes a vote has the, the effect of a referendum. The best example is the uh, vote for parliament in the winter of 45-46 when there were separate electorates, so the Muslims had their own electorate, and within that, 85% voted for the Muslim League, which was effectively a vote for partition. You see, that was really a referendum. It was not a vote for Nehru or Jinnah or so for persons. It was not a vote for parties. You see, Muslim League, all very nice, but that, you see, people were not so concerned with. What they were concerned with is partition, yes or no. So this was de facto uh, a referendum on, on partition. And in that case, too, that referendum turned out to be effective. Nobody wanted to go against Muslim opinion, so they got their partition. Um, anyway, so you see what I wanted to say is, OK, there you have popular uh, sovereignty in a, in a, you know, in a version that goes all the way, uh, that is not hemmed in by all kinds of uh, controls. Uh, so there you have real democracy. It's also the original Athenian democracy was also essentially direct democracy. With that, I'll come to the next question, which is about the direct democracy itself. It is often said that masses are too dumb to govern themselves. That has always been the argument against democracy. But aren't they? Doesn't governance require a specialized knowledge that the masses don't have? Yes, so um, democracy started in the 5th century BC and immediately there was an anti-democratic movement. And it was not on the margins, you know, of, you know, drunken, tattooed people, you know, doing Zeke Heil and so on. Uh, no, 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 this was uh, the great minds like Socrates and Plato were against democracy. And um, Socrates even paid for it. He was sentenced to death by the uh, popular assembly of the Athenians. So they in majority voted for the death penalty to Socrates. And so that has, from the beginning, been the prime example of why democracy is a bad system. Now, since then, all the arguments that have traditionally been used against democracy in general are now being repeated against direct democracy. And so, yes, you see, the, the usual argument is the people are too dumb you know, they're, they're too simplistic. Like, for example, in a referendum, you can only vote yes or no. Isn't that simplistic? Well, I'll tell you something. I worked in the Senate. You see, I know what the voting machines look like. You see, they vote 
yes or no. And you see they, they vote on some very complex legislation and there is no option to vote yes to this, no to this, halfway to this. No, no, it's yes or no. And so in the voting booth, you see that the referendum voter does the same thing. Uh, so that's not the difference. Then uh, in Parliament, in a party system, people vote according to the party discipline. You see, let's say that there is a, um, a vote in Parliament about nuclear energy. Now, most of the people who are sitting there don't know anything more about nuclear energy than the ordinary voter. Most of them are lawyers, for example. You know, they have no experience of that. By contrast, outside Parliament, you have many engineers and so on who can tell you the details about it. But they cannot vote in Parliament. And anyway, suppose that there is some rare nuclear en engineer who is sitting in Parliament. Even he is not going to use his expertise to vote because he has a commandment from the party chief. You know, you, you have to vote. Our party votes yes. You have to vote yes, even if you think no. Uh, so, you know, that change, I mean, that, that difference between the elite and the ordinary people is false. You know, there is this, this idea, you know, this, this always comes back in arguments against democracy, that the ruling class is somehow morally superior, that they are concerned with the general interest, whereas the voters are selfish, short-sighted. Well, that's a too positive opinion about the elite, right? But moreover, I mean, there are all kinds of ad hoc arguments. Uh, one that always comes back is to say, yes, in California you have referendums, and that's why the budget in California is always a problem. Now, that's not true. You see, the most radically direct democratic country is Switzerland. Switzerland is financially very healthy. Uh, they pay much less in taxes than, for instance, we in Belgium. Highest taxes in the world except for Sweden. Um, and a very big difference is that people who have a say in how their tax money is being spent, that is to say those who have power over policy decisions, they are far more correct in paying their taxes than people from whom taxes are effectively stolen and used to things that they have no say. And so, I mean, most of the arguments against, um, against direct democracy don't hold up. Uh, recently, there has also been the phenomena that uh, these new anti-immigration parties and anti-Islamic parties in Europe, they start demanding referendums. Why? Because it's the only way to, to get heard. You see, the whole elite is, you know, very determined in blocking this, this voice. So they want to be heard directly. Conversely, some of the left parties who used to be in favor of direct democracy now are against it precisely because they fear that the people is going to cast a wrong vote. Like in Holland, you have a party called Democraten 66, the Democrats of 1966, the year when the party was founded. They were always very much for democracy in every possible way, and so they were also for direct democracy. Well, you see, gradually in Holland, some limited form of direct democracy was introduced, and then they started agitating against it, and it has been abolished in the meantime. Uh, so, you see, when, when you see people uh, sacrificing their democratic principles because they want this uh, voting result rather than that, you can see that they're not serious about democracy. Um, so, I think direct democracy is a big step in the right direction. An argument you also often hear is that Hitler used direct democracy. No, he did not. 
You see, in Germany, like in many countries, you had referenda um, commanded by the government. So in direct democracy, you have people who put on the agenda a question of their own choosing, supported by a sufficient number of signatures. What you had in Nazi Germany was that a few times, it was the government that had people vote about silly questions like, are you along with Hitler for peace? You know? But, you know, suppose that there had been real referenda. For example, the army command and the party command thinks in 1939 of invading Poland. Well, you see, the, the, the grown-ups at that time were the young men in the First World War who had been in the trenches, who had seen all their comrades being shot to pieces. They were very much against the war. If there had been a referendum, are we going to have the Second World War or not, it is very certain that people would have voted against. So, you know, watch out with condemning the direct democracy. It, um, it has its uses. As Dr. L say, these arguments against direct democracy doesn't hold up. Let's keep the specific of direct democracy for later in this lecture and focus on the idea of democracy itself. Is there anything virtuous or desirable about popular sovereignty as against monarchy or oligarchy? After all, throughout history, most people have acquiesced in an unequal share in power which was mostly reserved for one leader or smaller upper class. Do ordinary people want sovereignty at all? When you look at history, you might indeed doubt that. Most people have been perfectly satisfied in being a subject. Uh, they, they followed the leader, they were worshippers of the leader. And um, you see themselves being very busy with all kinds of practical things, you know, survival. Uh, usually didn't aim that high of, of sharing in power. Uh, and you see this very much in India, where you see people do not have much of a desire to meddle in politics. You can see this uh, right now, the, um, the devotees of the BJP government, the media cell, and so on. They are always defending the leader. The leader knows best. You know, you know it, it may seem funny what he's doing, but he has a strategy, you know. You think it's not okay, but it's a master stroke. You know, so they have this naive trust in the leader. And so this, um, this has been there all the time. You see, people admire power. So if, through non-democratic means, you have power visibly, then that itself is going to attract many people to you. Last week, I was at a conference about Mahatma Gandhi. And there was a leftist scholar there. I'll not, not mention her name, but so... She argued that the difference between Nehru and Gandhi was not very big. You know, people always say, yeah, Gandhi was a traditionalist and Nehru was a modernist. They were poles apart. No, you see, in that respect, they were, they were separate, but mostly they were on the same wavelength. And even there, you see, they um, had the same assumptions about Hinduism. You see, both of them had this Orientalist European notion that Hinduism was backward. And so Gandhi, believing in Hinduism, was all for backwardness. And Nehru was all for modernism, and he was against Hinduism. But so both of them assumed, you see, Hinduism backward, you know, British modern. And so that they had in common before they were pulled apart in which choice they made here. Um, so in many respects, they, they, they had things in common. And this appeared very clearly when uh, Gandhi foisted Nehru upon the nation. You see, the, um, the choice of who is going to lead Congress and therefore 
in the impending independence is going to be chosen as the head of government. Um, so that choice was made by the Congress Working Committee in favor of Sardar Patel. And there was nothing that Nehru could do to stop it or that Gandhi could do to stop it. You see, that the outcome of the vote was totally clear. Now, there is a way to win a vote even, even when you lose it. You make sure that the winning candidate withdraws. And so that's what Gandhi did. He prevailed upon his yes man, uh, Sardar Patel, to withdraw his candidature. So that the only candidate was Nehru. And with a very poor minority, he nevertheless won because he was the only one. So that's very much Gandhi's doing. Now, against that, she said, yeah, but no, Nehru was very popular. And the argument she used was, but he has won the election several times. Yes, he won the elections after he had been made prime minister. You see, all the people who went to vote, they voted for the man in power, for the leader. And, you know, if Sardar Patel had been there, he would also have won. And the, the modern phenomenon of uh, people casting an anti-incumbency vote, where they are just tired of whoever is in power and they want someone else, that didn't exist yet at the time. You see, I mean, Congress at that time had the aura of we have wrested independence from the British, which is historically not too accurate, but anyway, that's what everybody thought. And... Um, and they had no rivals. The Hindu Mahasabha, you know, wasted it by having one of its members, well, it didn't have one of its members do that, but one of its members assassinated Gandhi. So then the, the Hindu Mahasabha was out of the picture. The Muslim League, of course, was out of the picture. It had gone to Pakistan. And so Congress was all alone. So obviously, Nehru had a majority, though not a majority of the popular vote. You see, Congress a number of times successively has had very large uh, majorities in Parliament. These were never based on more, or on, on more than or even just 50% of the vote. They were always minority votes. But because of the electoral system first past the post, they had far more than 50% of the seats. And so... You see, at that time, Nero was simply the man in power. Of course, they voted for him. And if there had been someone else, they would have voted for him. Uh, so you see this argument, yeah, but Nero was popular. It's not because he was popular that he was made the prime minister. You see, there had been no vote. He had not won a popular vote. He had not even won a vote in a very limited circle of the Congress Working Committee. He was foisted on India, okay? But so this to illustrate the principle that democracy needs a certain maturation. And so people who are just thrown into democracy, as happened with the Indian people at the time of independence, they need a generation or two before they start, you know, understanding the ways of democracy. As we understand, people need time to understand democracy and people can't be thrown into it. With that, I come to the next question. That Islam radically rejects democracy. It says power belongs to God, who has revealed his laws. In a sense, Christianity says the same and has opposed democracy till recently. God knows the best. Isn't there something to be said for that? And to what extent is it true for Hinduism? Yes, it starts with Judaism, the laws of Moses. So you have the famous Ten Commandments. The first three are a new theology, monotheism, iconoclasm. And then you have the usual uh, moral principles. You see, don't steal, don't lie, don't uh, covet your neighbor's wife. Um, so these are no very old moral principles. We didn't need gold for that. They already existed. Look at... The, the Dharma commandments in the Manu Smriti or so, they're very similar. And so this just follows from human experience. 
you know, if you have a society where everybody steals from one another, where everybody kills one another, you know, it is all kind of problems. So you have to have this principle and teach that to the children from, from, from early on that, you know, you can't behave like that. So those are put there in order to give more respectability to this new theology. Because these principles already existed before there was monotheism, before there was an iconic uh, worship. Uh, but so from then on they, they, they are taken together. Then in Jewish law you have a number of other laws, you know, like, like on, on Sabbath, you know, on the rest day, uh, you're not allowed to light fire, which is why today in Jerusalem you can't operate the elevator because the elevator is igniting electricity, which is a kind of fire. So what they do there in high-rise buildings, they simply have the lift go up and down all the time. So you don't have to start it. Anyway, so you have a number of these commandments. And when Christianity comes about, initially it's a Jewish sect, and so they keep all these commandments. Then St. Paul abolishes that. And so that, that becomes defining for Christianity. There's no divine law. Um, then um, St. Augustine uh, decrees that the only law is charity. So if you consider whether you should do something, ask yourself, is this motivated by charity? And if it is, then do it. And if you sneakingly feel that no, you know, it's, a, you know, it's essentially selfish, but I dress it up as altruistic, no, 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 then, then go with your hunch and stay away from it. So only if it's real charity, then you can do it. So that's the simplicity of Christian law. And so for all practical purposes, Christians follow the law of the land. Like in the Roman Empire, there was a small little nervous sect, the Christians. They had no power, they could not impose their own law, so they followed Roman law. But then comes Islam, and Islam starts as a kind of Christian sect. You see, in Christianity, you have the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And so in the Catholic Church, and then in the breakaway Protestant churches, that is still taught. But you had a few so-called heresies where they didn't believe in the Trinity, where they said, okay, God, God the Father, but no Jesus. I mean, they venerate Jesus. They don't worship him because he's not God. To them, he's just a very special human being, not God. Okay? Now, that sect develops into Islam, which is a very interesting but very complicated story. It's not for now. And so in Islam, you have a lot of Jewish elements again, including this idea of a law revealed by God. And so some of it is in the Quran, most of it is in the life of the Prophet. So the, the main thing in Islamic law is the precedent of the Prophet. If you can show in an Islamic court, let's say you're accused of some un-Islamic behavior, if you can show that you are just imitating the prophet, then you go free. Then they can't condemn you because they can never say, oh, Muhammad was a bad Muslim. But so there the idea is that, you see, man is too small, too ephemeral, you know, too limited to make laws. So the only law has to come from God. That's very much the idea in Islam. Christianity is, uh, is more broad-based. It doesn't have this, this one revelation. So for many less important things, it just goes with what is done in the world. But there, you know, it, 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 it goes very far in accepting the world. And so what it accepts is the power structure of the world. There you have the idea that all power comes from God. And so, we went from the 18th century onwards, ideas of equality and democracy and so on came up. The church was against those. It said, no, no, you should not be 
you know, uh, you should not have hubris. You should not think that you are capable of doing this. You see, those who have been put above you, the kings and the cardinals and so on, they know better. And so, so you see, don't claim authority for yourself, be obedient. And so that was the church attitude until the 20th century, essentially. Like in the, in, the, in the interbellum, for example, it was a thing that they called clerical fascism. The church was rather against fascism, which was a very atheist movement, secular nationalist. Yet they had their own form of authority worship. And so a number of uh, dictators were Catholic especially. And um, so they also imposed their authority. They didn't believe in democracy. But they paid lip service a little bit to God. You see, it's, it's, not, it's not that the leader has all power. No netaji or anything. No, you see, we essentially obey to God, but effectively you have to obey the dictator. So you had Franco in Spain, you had uh, Dolfus in Austria, uh, similarly Tiso in Slovakia and so on. Um, and so, you see, democracy was associated with the French Revolution, which was against the feudal power, against the king and so on, and at the same time against the church. And so, on the opposite pole, you get an objective alliance between the church and the feudal power structures. And so, in the 19th century, when the revolutionaries have been defeated, um, that again comes alive. Uh, like, for example, um, after Napoleon, the Dutch become independent again. They used to be occupied by France. Uh, now, before French occupation, they were a republic. And so then you see to be welcome again in the Committee of Nations, the great powers, Austria, England and so on, demand that they become a monarchy. So then they start a royal dynasty. Uh, same thing with Belgium. Belgium becomes independent, essentially by some uh, revolt, uh, coup d'etat, by nostalgics of the French Revolution. But then you see England comes in between and says, okay, you can have your state, but it has to be a monarchy. And they at once send an unemployed prince from their own court to become the king of Belgium. Um, so, and that was very much all supported by the church. And so so-called Christian democracy is a 20th century movement where they finally accept uh, democracy. Uh, but so that's... That's the same inspiration as what you find very upfront in the case of Islam. Now, what I think of it is that, well, you know, for people who didn't know better, that is perhaps the best they could do. But I think we have outgrown that. So what about Hinduism? To what extent is it true for Hinduism? You should know what I get to hear <laughs> coming here to Delhi. Uh, you see, some people say, yeah, you see, democracy was always there in Hinduism. They point, for example, to the existence of a number of republics in ancient India. Uh, like, for instance, the Buddha is often called Prince Siddhartha Gautama. He was not a prince. He was the son of the president for life of the Shakya Republic. And so, you see, people were elected not like in our system for four or five years. They were elected for life, and then when they died, then somebody else would be elected. It would not automatically be his son who succeeded him. Uh, but so the Buddha was very well placed. He could have become the successor simply by his own influence, his own personality. The Buddha was a member of the, the Senate, you know, the, 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 the council of that republic from his, his age 20 onwards. Um, but so he was not automatically the successor. He was not a prince in the feudal sense of the term. So you had a number of republics that ultimately, one after another, get sucked up by the expanding empire of Magadha. Magadha in present-day uh, Bihar. 
But so because of those republics, many people say, yeah, you see, India is the oldest democracy. Also, you have at the village level, the panchayats. Now, again, panchayat is not at all a democracy in the modern sense, but at least it was some kind of consultative assembly where every caste was represented. High caste, low caste, in between castes, and they had an equal say. Now, of course, the caste sent a representative. You know, the, the, you know, the, the leaders among them decided, yes, this one. And so, it's, again, it's not a matter of, of elections or so. Then, in their consultations, they didn't decide by majority vote. They aimed for a consensus. Uh, so, I mean, all this is a bit different from modern democracy, but at least it was not a monarchy. Uh, there was consultation, so that's, you know, that is commendable. Many Hindus say, you see, oh, this, this democracy that the British pushed on us, you know, that's a bad system. And so people who try to respect the language of democracy, they say, you know, what we need is a presidential democracy, not this parliament with its fragmentation. Um, you see, a full uh, representative parliament, pro proportional, where you see the percentage of one particular ideology among the people is represented by that same percentage in parliament, that's very rare. I know only two countries that really follow this is Israel and the Netherlands. And so there you have many parties and a practical result is that when time comes to form a government, you know, it takes a lot of time to get everyone on the same page, to get so many parties together. Um, but on the other hand, it is the most democratic system. You see, every tendency is represented. You know, in, in Britain, for example, you can't get a Green Party, an ecologist party. Whereas in Germany, in Holland and so on, this broke through because the electoral system facilitated it. In England, only the large parties uh, can be represented, and they perpetuate their power. Um, so in India, you hear people say, yeah, this Westminster system, we have to get rid of it. We have to get something like in America, a uh, presidential system. Now, of course, I know people who are against this. For example, in France in the 1950s, you had a proportional system. It, was, it led to chaos. You know, one government fell, the next fell, the, the next one also fell. And then uh, General uh, Charles de Gaulle made an end to it. You see, he brought a new system, so-called Fifth Republic, um, which was a presidential system. And so the opponent said, well, this is a permanent coup d'etat. This is just one person who draws all power to himself. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I can't easily uh, decide between those alternatives. But what I notice is that in India, very many people say we should have this presidential system. Like in his autobiography, Alke Adwani, or the BJP makes that point. Now, that you could say is a modern form of what they really want at heart, is a king. And um, you see, for example, the enormous popularity of the Maharajas. They lost all power after independence, but they are still very much applauded by their people. And so that attitude is there also the way that people deal with their leaders. Okay, they may be elected on election day, but from that day onwards, they are like the king and they are being venerated like that. And so that, that is quite deep in the Indian mentality. And so these republics, you know, these are ancient republics, they're more than 2,000 years ago. People have completely forgotten about them. And so they, you know, with their worshipful, you know, bhakta attitude, you know, they easily take that worshipful attitude towards the political leader. So I'll take you back again towards ancient republics, as it was my next question, though you have answered some part of it already. So like you said, Many ancient Indian states were republic, as it is claimed by many scholars in India. The oldest one 
which is often quoted is Vaishali, situated in Bihar and uh, existed somewhere around 500 to 600 BC. Again, like you said, the best known person associated with this was the Gautam Buddha. Even in Ramayana, at the time of coronation of Sri Ram, we hear that all the kings from all over India were invited to raise their voice if they agreed with the coronation or disagreed with the coronation of Sri Ram. It didn't happen, that's another story. But all the kings were asked for their opinions. That's what we hear from Valmiki Ramayana at least. Though you have answered it to some extent already, but I'll rephrase the question. Was India the source of democracy? As the present government claims, because Indian way of ruling wasn't absolute monarchy, as you have already highlighted. Yeah, it's uh, exaggerated. And so, most people who matter in history were monarchs, mm -hmm. or people related to monarchs. Um, so, Rama was a king. And um, before that, you know, Kuru, his ancestor, was a king, and Bharata was a king, and so on. So, you know, kingship was the rule rather than the exception. And, and you get all the typical events that, that, that happen in a feudal system, like a war of succession. You see, when the, the king dies, then, you know, his sons quarrel among each other. Who has the right to succeed him? Sometimes entire wars follow from it. That's what the Mahabharata is about. So... To say India is the source of democracy, well, it has contributed and the democratic element is all, always there. But I wouldn't say, you know, formally monarchy is more important, though there is an element of democracy within monarchy, it, which is that the, the, the kings also listen to the people. You see, typically, ancient kings had some council of notable, you know, people like they're moneylenders, you know, very important. You know, they're, they're court priest, you know, they're army leader. I mean, a few important people, you know, advise the king. And so wise kings also listened to the people. They didn't call them to the ballot box, but, you know, they, they heard, you know, and, and, and also their, uh, their counselors, each had his own specific field. And he would hear out people on, on that uh, topic. And so sometimes people would tell the king, but, you know, watch out because the people are dissatisfied because of this and this. An example, and maybe not the most commendable example, is in the life of Rama, at least according to the last chapter, of which many people say that it was a later interpolation. Anyway, m many people believe in it. And so... It says that um, Rama heard a rumor that people were uh, backbiting against Sita. That they had this rumor about, uh, you know, Sita is not chaste, you know, she was suspected chastity. She shouldn't be the queen. And, you know, a king, of course, has the right to take other wives. You know, why doesn't Rama drop Sita and, and go somewhere else? And so Rama listens to that. He repudiates uh, Sita. He sends her away to the forest, even though she's pregnant. And so many people like to quote that, look how misogynistic Rama was. You know, that's a bit of modern construction of it. But at any rate, it's not nice. And so if that is democracy, then you would doubt, you know, should we really abide by democracy? Uh, at any rate, you see, those complicated questions, those, you know, food for thought, you know, already exist in ancient India. That, that is clear. So people's opinion mattered, but to what extent monarchs used to exercise power is debatable. Or, or for example, um, there is the case of uh, Rama's father. You see, he, um, he has three wives. To the third one, he has promised that her son will become the successor. She's Bharata. And um, so this creates a lot of trouble because he had earlier promised it to Rama. And the people all expect Rama to become king. Then suddenly, 
you see, even the mother of the, that other song also accepts this. But then she is very democratic. She listens to what her housemaid has to say. And that, you see, that illiterate woman remembers, ah, but he promised to you that your son would be a successor. And then that's what happens. And then because of this democratic voice, you know, the expected coronation of Rama is put off. And he's exiled. So, you know, the democracy is there to some extent, but it's not always positive. Yes, sir. That indeed created a lot of problems. Speaking from Ramayan's perspective, Dashrath promised two boons to Kekai and she ended up using them at that time, which was least expected by King Dashrath. And she asked for coronation of Bharat instead of Ram and exile of Sri Ram as the second boon. Exactly. And she forgets it in all the happy atmosphere around Rama's coronation. And then it's his, her maid who reminds her. So, Dr. Elst, with that I come to the next question, which is related to China. Under Xi Jinping, China has gradually reverted to Maoism with full one-party dictatorship, which few in either India or Europe will welcome as an alternative to democracy. But 10 or 20 years ago, at the height of the liberalization, set in the motion by Deng Xiaoping, China did seem to offer an alternative, a kind of benign despotism under a vanguard party that was communist only in name but was more like the old aristocratic system idolized by Confucius. Wasn't China's success proof that it was good? Yes, um, when I was a student, this was at, uh, just after the Cultural Revolution when Deng Xiaoping's reforms had not yet taken hold. The first Chinese students were sent to the West and they were very defensive about democracy. You see, the, this was told them all the time by people who said, yes, but in China you don't have democracy. And so they said, no, but we are all for democracy, but first we need prosperity. If people have nothing to eat, you know, what use is democracy for them? And so now, thanks to communism, we are achieving, you know, full uh, prosperity and so on. Not entirely true, but okay, that's what they said, what they probably believed. And today that's no longer the case. You see, people who are sort of in solidarity with their regime, and that's most of them, say openly that democracy is a bad system. They are proud of not being democratic. And so they, they, they look at the democracies, you know, they say, look in America what polarization you have of the left against the right, I mean, the woke against the conservatives. I mean, this enormous polarization that has gone on. Or look at Europe, how nothing works. You know, I mean, like, decisions have to be taken about public works in the city close to where I live, in Antwerp. And it goes on and on, years after years after years, and they just can't come to a decision. Why? Because of democracy, or at least that's what the Chinese say, you know. I mean, everybody is listened to, and, you know, nobody is there to really... Uh, take a decision, impose a decision. So the Chinese system is much better. And so as an argument they use, well, the fact that China is such a success. Now, China has not always been a success. And today it is much less a success than 10 years ago. So maybe this is not entirely due to a communist party rule. But, you know, what, what is true is that some 10 years ago, there really was a feeling that China was offering an alternative to Western democracy. Uh, there was a book at the time which really made waves called The China Wave by um, uh, Zhang Weiwei. 
And um, subtitle, The Rise of the Civilizational State. That's a term that is now also very popular in India. So his point was that China is more than a nation state. China embodies a civilization that is already thousands of years old. And uh, it needs a strong leadership to keep up that state. And so it always has. You see, in China, there never was a democracy. Not even a semblance of democracy, not even an ancient form of democracy. No, really, absolutely no democracy. And um, so this, uh, this Jiang Weiwei defended that. He said, well, you know, what we need is what Mao Zedong called a vanguard party. And so today the Communist Party is indeed less communist. You see, communism as an economic system was dissolved by Deng Xiaoping. Uh, but at least it, it has the power, it monopolizes power. And so that could be seen as a new form of what has always existed in China. So you, you have like the, the confusion ruling class the last 2,000 years. And so that now takes the form of this uh, sole uh, ruling party. And so they pointed out that in a way, you see, the system was more democratic than the democracies because the party saw to it that in the People's Assembly, Indeed, their equivalent of parliament, all kinds of people were represented. In Western parliaments, originally, you see, only the, 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 the earl and the duke and so on were present. Then other people who had made it, you know, industrialists and so on, were also there. It's only when the socialist parties uh, get a representation that you get working men in parliament, people who have not studied, who from you know, 10 years on were going to the factory. And so suddenly they find themselves in parliament. Today that doesn't exist anymore. Even the Socialist Party and so on, they all are graduates. You know, people who really stand on the 10th story, you know, laying bricks and you know, working with their hands, those people are not in parliament. Well, in China they are. So you see, that's what they're proud of. You see, our system is really more democratic than the so-called democratic system. And um, then there is the results. You see, in, in, in the West you always have to, you know, take into account all kinds of lobby groups and so on. In China, if the leadership says this way, then it will happen this way. No discussion. And so it's a fast system. So that's one of the arguments against democracy. Democracy, you know, is chaotic and it lasts long and so on. You know, if you have the man at the top who decides, then you have a clear decision and everybody abides by it. So that was the argument at the time. And so it was buttressed by the success of China in, econ in economics, of course, but in other fields also. And then the international radiation of China was suddenly enormous with their Belt and Road Initiative. And so many countries, even in Europe, you see, they gave up their leadership, historical leadership role and, and became followers, you know, client states of China. And so th there was a big stride forward. However, now, you see, Deng Xiaoping has gone back to the communist model. He also revives these communist ideals of equality. Under Deng Xiaoping, you see that the saying was that getting rich is glorious. And so under Deng Xiaoping, you have again the idea that, yeah, but the differences shouldn't be too big. You see, we should take from the rich to give to the poor. And so these communist ideas are back again. And now China is not, not only because of those reasons, but it so happens that China is not doing so well anymore. And, um, you know, a number of things come at the same time, like their demographic crisis. That's not part of their economic policy. 
nevertheless, you know, it's it's something that now is happening. And um, so this comes at a time when the superiority of the Chinese model is uh, is meeting its borders, you know. And um, so, ten years ago, you could say that in places like Africa, many people looked up to the Chinese model. That is a bit less the case now. But okay, you know, that's one of the trends that we must signal that we must be aware of when we discuss democracy worldwide. Where it will go, I, um, I don't make any predictions. Coming to my next question and coming back to India again. The Westminster system of representative democracy which is followed in India, is it fit for India? Is it beneficial for Hinduism? Well, um, it's apparently not fit for India. Very many people say that. And um, I can understand why. The, the system works in England because there you have two or three parties and, you know, it's easy to form a government because one of them will practically always have more than 50% of the seats. Whereas in India, you have a very complex situation where you, you have to cobble together a coalition. So, you see, many people are not satisfied with it. Um, then you have the issue of uh, federalism. You see, you can have different coalitions at the state level than at the federal level, uh, and then quarrels between them. So, yes, uh, one thing you could do is simply just have one country and uh, make it simple, you know, um, like uh, like in France, for example, there the model has always been to have just one country, one language, and a, a uniform democratic system all over the country, no local peculiarities and so on. England is a bit uh, a bit more diversified, but then you come to places like America, where you have strong federalism, where the states have a strong identity, you know, and defend their uh, their sovereignty or their limited sovereignty. Um, and so in India, it it goes even much farther because uh, you have different languages, and so to keep all that together is a very complicated matter. You know, you can forgive prime ministers quite a bit because they have a very rough job. Far more difficult than in America or in China or so. You have more imposition of uniformity. Um, yeah, well, so, you know, probably they, they are going to opt for a, a different system. Uh, the Hindu nationalists already for a very long time insist on more uniformity. That's why the idea of a presidential system, you know, to have a, a clear, you know, figurehead at the top, who, who, not just a figurehead, but who also wields real power. So that, you know, that makes an end to all the quarreling. Um, I'm not sure I'm in favor of that. I, I think that if you have that system, you're going to enjoy the benefits for a while, and then you're going to get the drawbacks also, just like you now have with this system. So, I, I mean, I don't expect too much from changes in the system. So, we can expect some repercussions if we change the system, but at this time, in India at this moment, two major changes in the parliamentary systems are being debated. One is the redivision of seats in keeping with the demographic changes, so the southern complied best with the government policy of birth control and are now being punished for it with loss of power. Is this right, sir? This is what is happening. Okay, so it is very clear that the percentage of Tamils and, and Malayalis and so on is lower today than it was 50 years ago because they have dutifully practiced birth control. Whereas in the Hindi belt, this was much less the case. And so now the Hindi belt has a much larger percentage 
And so, if you believe in democracy, in the power of numbers, then they will have to have more seats in parliament. And so, do you want democracy or not? So yes, you see, that is one of the perverse effects of democracy. I know. You see, people who work for democracy, like myself, are not the ones who idealize democracy. You see, the, 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 yes, democracy brings with it its difficulties, and they, they have to be dealt with. You see, it's people like, for instance, the European Union leaders, who are not Democrats at heart at all, who think that they know best about what is good for the people. You know, they always talk about democracy. You know, uh, they idealize democracies. Their opponents, they call, you know, anti-democrats or, or, you know, a very good rhetorical trick. They call them populists. You see, when you want to say something good about democracy, you call it democracy. When you want to say something bad about it, you call it populism. So your opponents are populists, whereas you are a democrat. See? But so, yeah, I mean, the, the, here, you know, I have no ready-made solution. It's a fact that in democracy you will have problems like that. Now coming to the second change, the second change is the proposal of only one election for the center and the states at the same time. Is this not against the spirit of federalism? against India or Bharat being a union of state as it is often called? Yes. Now, first, first let's clarify the expression, a union of states. Okay, so Rahul Gandhi has used this expression to pretend that, you see, India is a conglomerate of states with a separate identity. That's not how India has come about. You see, that's how the European Union has come about. You have a number of countries with their own history and at some point they throw in their lot together. They make a pact, you know, a contract and then you get this idea of an ever closer union. They bring in more and more topics into the, you know, united policy. In the beginning it was only uh, coals and steel and then you see more and more, you know, cultural elements. Uh, were brought in and and now we have a you know pretty close uh, political union. Um, in India, that's not what happened. You could say in history, long, long, long ago, you had many more states that gradually grew together or were conquered one by the other. But you see what happened now with the Indian Republic, it has grown out of British India, which was a colonial system with parts controlled by the British Crown and then parts controlled, you know, by remote control through the Maharajas and the Nawabs and so on, who were nominally independent but effectively part of British India. So there was already one united political structure. It was at the same time diversified, but essentially it was one. It was under the British Crown, now it's under the Indian Republic. And so the states were not um, negotiated with separately. There was no negotiation between, let's say, Mysore and uh, the Indian Republic. No, you see, the Indian Republic said, okay, this is, this is what you have to do. You know, if you join, you know, we impose all this. And you have no say in the matter. And um, so that's what happened, you see. it's. One state that absorbed whatever diversity existed. And so, you know, this idea of union of states is a, is a rather unfortunate expression because it doesn't really describe what has happened. And so it is the, the united state of India that then formed states as parts of, of it, as administrative units. Like, for instance, it is the government that accepts, after, in this case, some pressure from below, the formation of the states of Andhra, which was part of a Madras presidency. And so then there is pressure from Poti Sri Ramulu to create a linguistic state. And so then 
India forms this linguistic state. Later on, India also decides to split up that linguistic state into Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. It, it decides to split Punjab from Haryana and, and those things. But so all these things are happening within, uh, within India. So it's not a union of state in the sense of pre-existing states. Nevertheless, these states have a certain identity of their own, and that linguistic uh, principle has, of course, mightily contributed to that. Now, I think from a democratic viewpoint, these linguistic states are a very good and necessary thing. You see, if you want to debate, you know, what policy to follow, well then, of course, you need a common space for debate which in practice presupposes a common language. And so you see the Tamils go their own way, the Kanadigas go their own way. And, um, you know, that, that, that is what you have to live with. You see, there is a certain diversity. You know, each state uh, has its own identity, but not too much. You see, they are still also all part of India, usually proud of being Indian. But so you have these two levels, you see, a, a mega level of India as a whole, and then a level, you know, more familiar, more closer to home with smaller states. Now there, of course, you can quarrel, you know, what is a good size for a state? Uh, what dialect should be treated as a separate language and get a separate state? All these small tribal languages, they're not worth a state, but maybe they deserve some level of autonomy. Uh, like you have in Russia, for example, in the Soviet Union, whatever else was wrong with it. You see Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his book, Rebuilding Russia, which was written after the fall of the Soviet Union. He um, comments, you see, he praises the fact that in the Soviet Union, different levels of separateness were recognized. You see some small tribe of a few thousand people, you know, had, had a lower level of autonomy than a large people had. But still, you see, their, their separate identity was recognized at some level. So this you could also do in India. Like, for instance, one, one practical problem that I studied a little bit is Tulu Nadu, the Tulu speaking region in coastal Karnataka. I don't speak Tulu. You know, I have a few Tulu books which I try to decipher, but it's, I'm never going to get anywhere. Um, but I, I've been to Mangalore and Udupi a few times. I, I really love the place. And so I noticed that there is a movement for a separate Tulu-speaking state, and I greatly support it. You see, this is not separatism. In Europe, you had uh, five years back or so, this question of Catalan separatism against Spain. And there was a referendum in Catalonia, which had a narrow majority in favor of independence. But you see, Spain blocked it, and the European Union also didn't support it. But in fact, the European Union is the answer to this. You see, because both Spain and Catalonia remain part of the European Union, it doesn't matter if they form separate units. Just like the breakaway of Telangana from Andhra Pradesh was a completely bloodless affair. You see, it just was on the front page of the newspapers for two or three days, and then it was over. It was digested. Nobody made a fuss about it. And um, so, you see, that is what is possible. And, and I can, you know, Tulu Nadu might separate from uh, Karnataka. Now, I, I don't think that's really on the cards because the linguistic situation in Tulu Nadu is quite complex. There are also many Kanadiga, Kanada sp speakers, and there are other languages, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm glad I don't have to, uh, to, dis to decide there. But at any rate, I sympathize with the desire of the Tulu speakers for some level of political autonomy of their own. 
And so similarly with, uh, you know, the, the, the tribals in, in Jharkhand, in Bengal and so on. You know, two days ago I saw this uh, dance performance by a dance troupe from the Santal tribe that the president belongs to. And, you know, I mean, they, they have their little separate culture. Now, I wouldn't mind if to that, you know, corresponds a certain level of political autonomy. And so because of this, you know, this, this recognition of a certain autonomy to the different, you know, units of the federation, it is only logical that they follow their own political logic and that therefore their elections do not always coincide with what happens at the federal level. Though, again, I mean, here uh, you have to take into account the logistics of organizing these elections and so on. Though, in fact, I, I have the impression that it's rather an argument against this unification drive. You know, if you want to organize federal elections in India, it's very complicated. You have to deploy units of the army and so on. You can't deploy them all at the same time. So you have different days for these, uh, you know, federal elections. So that rather seems an argument for keeping the present system. So that the, the elections in Madhya Pradesh and the elections in Rajasthan and so on are each at a different time. Uh, okay, but so that is my foreigner's impression. That is really something that I leave to Indians to, uh, to decide. So union of states doesn't correctly define India. Even I would agree to that. Another argument that comes in this favor by many other Indic scholars who usually quote Vedas and Purans. Like for example, one famous quote is that India was known to its people as Bharat Kande, Jambu Dwipe. And many other such shlokas are there in both Vedas and Purans where they refer to the modern India as a single entity. Maybe it was not always politically united, but this land mass was always linked through its spirituality and pilgrimages which were spread all over India. So, sir, what would you say to that? Is that an acceptable argument according to you? Well, I mean, I, I think that's wonderful. You see the Sankalpa, mm -hmm. where you, you know, introduce a ritual by locating yourself in time and space. You see, you, know, you say, I belong to this family, my father was this one and so on. And I live in this country, you know, I live in this city, in this country, in this uh, continent. And so you are aware of being part of ever larger holes, which, which is a good thing, you know, which is uh, very truthful, very aware. So I'm all for that. And so there you see at once the formula for, you know, combining your loyalty to a local unit with your loyalty to a larger unit, with your awareness of an e even larger unit. Uh, so that's wonderful. You know, I, I'm all for that. So with that, I'll come to the next question. Now coming back to the direct democracy, which we were discussing earlier, we don't have a, such a thing in India. So please tell us first what this is. Is it being practiced anywhere? Like you quoted the example of Switzerland earlier. Is it similarly being practiced in full force somewhere else in the world? Well, Switzerland is the most complete form of it. And so in in, in these uh, political units within Germany and within the United States, probably some others, you have it. You have traces of it elsewhere, like for instance in France, every so many years you have one referendum about the institutions, sometimes about silly things, like the presidency used to be for seven years, then they had a referendum to change it to five years. I mean, very unimportant whereas really important things are not put to referendum. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, this, this idea that some, you know, some things are too important not to consult the people about, that exists in quite a few places. Well, in Switzerland par excellence. But so, in Holland, for example, they had a very prescient referendum some 10 years ago about whether Ukraine should become a member of the European Union. The idea was that every member state of the European Union should be able to have its say 
about the accession of a new state. And so, mostly because those who took the initiative for the referendum were very anti-European Union, the vote went against. Now, when you look at what happened with Ukraine afterwards, you see, maybe this was a very important topic. At the time, I thought, well, what are they talking about? Um, this seemed not to concern anyone. Maybe it was uh, quite prescient, though I don't know if I would have voted against. As far as I'm concerned, you see, of course, the enormous corruption in Ukraine has to be cleaned up. But, yeah, I mean, of course they can become members. When Portugal, Spain and Greece, that had been dictatorships, you see, became members of the European Union. They were also pretty far from the European ideal, but they have integrated and it has worked. So, you see, I'm, I'm not sure I would be against it, but at any rate, you see, the, the people who took the initiative for the referendum, they were against it and they won. So, what are the common arguments for and against direct democracy? The first argument for democracy is that it's intelligent in the sense that you get a feedback loop. Those who take the decisions are those who undergo the consequences of the decisions. You see, in a, in a you know, authoritarian system, that's not the case. You know, it's the man at the top who says, okay, we're going to war. But it's the boys in the field who have to, you know, be collected for the army, they get the gun thrown into their hands and then they have to, you know, go, go shoot. And, and all that they can get from it is hopefully they come back home alive. That's all. And so it's the generals who get the glory if they win. Um, so it's more intelligent if the people who are really concerned with the outcome also take the decision. Uh, so th that's, that's the basic argument in favor of democracy. Then, um, here in this case, uh, if you have representative democracy, very soon you will find that the representatives form a new elite and do not really represent the people. For example, in the Northeast, 2005 thereabouts, there was a proposal of a European Union constitution. Now, this was very laughable. The Indian constitution is already too long. That was far longer. And, it, you know, some people said this must be put to popular vote. And so several countries organized a referendum. Holland and France. And the parliamentarians in both countries were in majority in favor of this constitution. But you see, in the referendum it turned out that the popular voter in both countries was in majority against this constitution. So this meant not only that the constitution could not be accepted, which they solved in a very European Union manner, namely, they took the same texts and they gave them another label than constitution, and then they accepted them anyway. But so at least, you see, that this constitution had been voted out. But the interesting lesson is that the parliamentarians in both countries, and it would have turned out like that in most countries, were of a different opinion than the people they represented. So they weren't representing their, their voters. They were doing what they wanted. Yes, and so against that problem, a uh, referendum is the answer. Now, you don't have to always have a referendum. You see, many people are not concerned with what those people in Brussels or in Delhi are deciding. And, you know, their life goes more or less on, you know, regardless of what they decide. But sometimes it's important enough, and then they draw to themselves the right to impose a decision through referendum. And so, so it's not that, you see, they have to vote on everything. And on many things, they will simply have trust in what the people above us decide. It's only when they choose, this is important for me, here I want to have a say, then they will do it. And so I think that is eminently sensible.
if we just suppose that it is implemented in India, the largest democracy in the world. So, sir, what would be the consequences according to you? Well, I'm not going to hide from you that this is problematic. Because, you see, in, in many, on many issues, you know, they will vote one way or the other, just as the parties in parliament are going to vote one way or the other. I mean, not every issue is a matter of life and death. Okay? So, maybe they vote this way, maybe the parliament votes the other way, I don't know, but none of this is very dramatic. However, sometimes, yes, it may be dramatic. Suppose you have, like in Scotland, you had a referendum about independence. Suppose you have the same referendum in Kashmir. And effectively, that is what the separatists are demanding. You see, you know, United Plebiscit Front and so on. Uh, you know, the story behind this, I guess you know, but let's recapitulate. Um, Nehru uh, stopped the advance of the army. The army was busy reconquering the part of Kashmir that had been taken by Pakistan. So he stopped them and he took the issue to the United Nations. And so the United Nations says that this has to be decided by referendum. And so Nehru was all in, in, in favor of it. But the, the, the circumstance at that time was that Nehru was fairly confident of winning the referendum. And so that was not a decision taken on the basis of re religion. You see, many people now, Pakistanis and so on, are going to say, yeah, it's a majority Muslim country. Of course, they would have voted in favor of accession to Pakistan. That's not true. Uh, because at that time, uh, first of all, Islamic consciousness was not uniformly spread. Even after the, the partition referendum, which did show a large Muslim majority in favor of Muslim politics, yet, you see, there... It's, it's a mixed picture, like in Afghanistan, for example, when the war between Israel and the Arabs broke out in 1948. You see, some tribes asked the king, then there was a king in Afghanistan, for permission to go and fight in West Asia on the side of Israel. Because in Afghanistan there is this, this belief that some of the, the tribes' names are the same names as some of the, you know, prophets or so of the Old Testament. So, in spite of them being Muslims, they felt a kinship with the Jews. So they, they agreed to go fight on the side of the Jews. Okay, so, you know, at the time, these religious identities were not so fixed as they are today. Today, they all watch, you know, TV programs or now on the internet and so on. They, they get constant indoctrination in Islam. You see, back then this was much more loose. Um, so that's one factor. Then a uh, uh, probably decisive factor is the bad blood between Jinnah and Sheikh Abdullah, the Kashmiri leader. And so Sheikh Abdullah calculated that you see, if I join India, I don't have this enemy Jinnah to deal with. And moreover, India is going to be a lot more relaxed about Kashmiri autonomy than Pakistan is going to be. Is there, they're going to leave us to our devices as long as we don't break away, you know. Whereas Pakistan is going to meddle and, and militarize the area and so on. Um, so he was in favor of India and him being a very popular leader, probably would have taken the masses along with him. And there would have been a majority vote pro-India. At least, you see, that was what Nehru calculated. Uh, but it didn't quite come to that, because one of the conditions for a referendum was that Pakistan withdraw its troops. And that there would only be a, an Indian police force just enough to keep order and not to fight wars. And so that Pakistan refused. It kept its army there. And so nothing came of the referendum. Now later, when 
Sheikh Abdullah turned against Nehru, then of course the people would have voted for Pakistan, even more for independence. But if the choice was between India and Pakistan, they would not vote for India. And so since then, you know, if you would have a referendum, very probably the vote would not be in favor of staying with India. And even now, um, the atmosphere is a lot better. There's no terrorism or, well, very little terrorism in Kashmir anymore. Nevertheless, if those people were called to the secrecy of the voting booth, I guess they might still vote against India. So these are risks you take in direct democracy. So within Europe, the situation has been fairly stable. Now, of course, I fear for it, but so far, the last 70 years or so, those things were possible. You could say, okay, give a free hand to, to the people, you know, let them choose. You, nothing dramatic was at stake. Whereas in India, you are dealing with serious things like Kashmiri secession, maybe you get a revival of Naga separatism, of Tamil separatism, and so on. Because if you take that decision now, you don't know what circumstances are going to develop later on. And they may, you know, pick the fruits of the decision you have now taken. And so, you see, there I agree that what I wrote about direct democracy, I will 100% defend it in the case of Europe. In India, maybe uh, it'll take a few more generations before you can do that. So again, you see, Democracy is not always the answer. I think democracy is a good system. As Winston Churchill said, it's a bad system, but it is the, the best we have. Uh, but so, sometimes you have to put it between brackets in expectation of its full revival. But so sometimes, you know, it is not always the, the answer. In the Roman Republic, for example, Sometimes when there was a national crisis, you know, they had a republic, they had elected offices, but sometimes they elected, still election, but they elected for half a year, it couldn't be prolonged, they elected for half a year a dictator. So that dictator was democratically legitimated, but he had dictatorial powers for a short period. And so, you see, even those people, the Romans hated the idea of a king. They had removed their last king and they started a republic. But even they admitted that in, in some situations you need a strong, uh, strong government. So with this lesson, that though it could be beneficial for Europe, it will take some generations for India to adapt direct democracy. With that, we can end this session, sir, as it was my last question. Thank you for joining us today. It has been a pleasure and I'm sure our audience will learn a lot from this like they always have from your previous lectures. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Els. Thank you so much.